Hello YouTubers, this is a new session where I get to talk to you about a standard upgrade. This standard upgrade, if you're not familiar with the standard, it's a set of uh, theories, principles, and practices that um, a group of software engineers called the standard community got together to kind of evolve it and invest in it to build uh, what it really could be the closest to a, a maintainable enterprise level software, software that actually is easy to understand, intuitive enough, maintainable, and all that good stuff. This session is specifically about upgrading that standard a little bit. The standard is always in a draft mode. It never, it never, you know, is completed. It continues to grow about, with our learning and our experiences. And this particular session focuses heavily on the idea of upgrading the standard, even pushing it a little bit further to making it even a little bit more perfect than it was before. And that's really all it takes for growth. You have to keep pushing that kind of uh, needle forward until you get to the closest possible point to uh, perfect software or perfection in software engineering. Uh, this particular session is focusing on abstraction at the operational level. At the operational level, when you're build, when you're building a service, let's say a foundation service, and this service is supposed to be talking to a broker. Let's let's draw here on the diagram. Let's let's see what things look like in here. So, let's say you have something called student service. Students service right and this student service is something that kind of adds students you know your typical crowd operations right when you're integrating you know a dependency into the student you're injecting you know based on something called i storage broker so this is a broker an interface and this interface dictates the kind of through dependency injection the level of of implementation that you expect your service to accept in order for it to be able to process, uh, you know, the CRUD operations. So your iStorage broker will have, you know, an expectation of a method called add student like that. And it takes in a student like this. And then your service will say, I expect whatever implements that interface, that particular interface to implement something called iStudent. So I know how to talk to it. Very basic things. Everyone agrees to that. Dependency injection, no problem there. But here's the problem. <clears throat> this is all good and dandy as long as the underlying implementation, the actual concrete, let's say this is SQL storage broker. This is a SQL specific implementation that inherits or implements that interface, right? And it tries to implement this method here, right? The method is add student. It's all good and dandy. It's working great as long as there is a a perfect match between what your concrete class or concrete broker expects versus what the interface kind of dictates, right? But what if, you know, just out of curiosity, what if you're integrating with a database client and it's all RESTful, so you ended up with something like this, something that says um, uh, remote storage broker, and this remote storage broker doesn't give you the direct kind of access that you expect with, you know, a, a synchronous operation. So you have to only make an API call. So you try to go and implement this add student. It says, oh, sorry, you, you this is an asynchronous operation. You have to await this API call. What a lot of software engineers end up doing is that they go and do something like this. They go and say, you know, my API call async, and then they do dot result like that, right, which is very bad because you're blocking a thread from going and you're not allowing you know a proper integration with an api call just so you can bend it backwards to fit that interface but what if i told you this interface could be in some sort of um it's like a quantum state it could be synchronous it could be asynchronous i mean it's always asynchronous but it would give you a value when the value is present without you having to do any hacky stuff and it would give you the asynchronization, the task that you need, you know, if it needs an awaiting. So instead of saying add student like that, you could go and say my expectation is add student async, but it fits both the synchronous and asynchronous, right? I know what a lot of people are thinking. A lot of people are saying, oh, Hassan's just going to go and do something like this, task dot from result and pretend that something is working the way it is. No, that's not it. I'll show you in a second what that looks like. So let's jump to the code. A while ago, um, we did have the conversation about value task, right? And value task is really this this kind of um, uh, model that would 
you know, to be the closest thing we have to something that could handle both states, like synchronous and asynchronous. I'll show you that in a second. So I'm going to hop over to to the, yeah, there you go. So here's, here's Visual Studio. Uh, I'm going to kind of revert everything because I was just kind of trying to show um, a showcase, you know, the, the, the situation. Okay, there you go. So you have this situation. You have an interface in here, and this interface is iQueryable select all GUs. So it really mandates that the method will always be synchronous, right? And that kind of a problem because the underlying client, you know, could be both that synchronous or asynchronous. And if the client decides to be asynchronous and it's supposed to be built asynchronously, uh, now the client is influ influencing your interface and influencing your up, upper level or upstream services. That's a huge problem, right? You're not supposed to do that. Instead, we can basically, and I'm going to kind of add in here something called value task. Here you go, value task in here. And value task will say, well, if the value is present, great. But if it's not present, then go ahead and asynchronize, you know, and be able to implement. So now this guy will support both scenarios, whether there is an awaitable, you know, kind of operation in the implementation of that interface or non-awaitable. It could be either one of them. I'll show you. If I go down here and I say, okay, I want to implement this. This, by, by the way, this is super old code. It's a, it's something that I've written at least two or three years ago. It pulls all geos, like old cities in the United States. It's it's a really cool. I'll send you the you know in the 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 the, the link in the description. But then let's just implement the uh, the value task, the awaitable aspect of this. So here's value task, like that. There we go like this and in this value task I'm gonna go ahead and basically make this asynchronous so this is async that's the new interface and look I didn't have to do this hacky little thing with oh task dot from result or anything like that because this scenario will support both I mean Visual Studio is gonna bark at you but Visual Studio is just a toaster it's a machine it doesn't understand the depth of the human mind and the, the, the innovative way uh, uh, humans or engineers can 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 write software if this is an awaitable for whatever reason, right? I'll just pretend that there's an awaitable operation. You could always go and say task dot from result. This is just an example because I don't have an API for it. And then you can put whatever you want in there, whatever whatever works for you, right? New list, whatever geos, uh, whatever you want to put in there that makes this kind of a, an operation. So whether the underlying uh, client is either um, um, awaitable or asynchronous or synchronous it doesn't matter at all right because either way the interface will support that which is a huge advantage of course right you don't want your interfaces to change just because your underlying client decides to be asynchronous or synchronous that's that's the true meaning of abstraction we have this conversation in the standard community, right? And some people brought up some really good points, right? People will start talking about, well, what if, you know, is this is this slow? Is this fast? Is this going to work right? I don't know. Let's find out together. How about that? I'm going to go into my uh, foundation service in here, and I'm going to add another one, right? You don't go modify your existing code that people are using, even though this one, no one is really using this, but I'm trying to make this like a good teachable moment where people can understand that, you know, oh, we're, well, we, we really don't have to, uh, you shouldn't modify existing code. Open for extension, close for modification, extend your interface, sure, put a V2, sure, but don't modify your existing code. That's just a bad habit. And instead of doing that, of course, this guy's going to be angry. You know, I'm going to take this guy. I'm going to go down here. I'm just showing you the actual migration process because I'm going to ask a lot of people to do this. So they need to see the migration process. This is a value task. This is a sync value task. This is value task like that. There you go. So this guy is going to be returning a value task of a um, of an iQueryable of a geo. There you go. And this is retrieve all geos. See, your try catch now is angry. Why is it angry? Because your exception handling only handles this iQueryable operation. So you're going to have to kind of create a different flow in here, a different delegate. For handling exceptions there you go and maybe I'll call this async like for now you know returning geos function async of course this is supposed to replace that but like I said you shouldn't be uh, overriding existing work especially if it's 
out there in production or even in UAT environment. If you're, if you're in a testing environment, you shouldn't allow something like that to happen. See, here's a new try catch. This is a sync value task like that, like that. There you go. And you would just want to await want to await this operation here. So this is the operation I'm going to wait. I'm trying to show you like the migration process as I'm doing it. Are we over 120? No, we're good. It's just the, the screen size. And uh, I'm going to go back here. This guy should relatively be okay. This is old code. We used to put the try catch in the same line, but now we don't have to do that. And now this is this can be awaited like that. And this is async. And we used to actually validate coming back from storage until we got hit by this idea of like I queryable. You shouldn't materialize it until people actually need it. So let me clean up that code a little bit just so people know this is that. So okay, so I had these I have these two operations, one that retrieves asynchronous asynchronously and one that does not. One that just kind of you know plays with the iQueryable. Let's go up to the controller real quick. Let's do the migration at the controller level. And I'm basically going to do something very similar. I'm going to copy this guy. I'm going to steal this guy. Instead of action result, this is an async value task, action result of an iQueryable of a geo, of an action result of an iQueryable of a geo. Super fun, huh? And then this is async. And then instead of, I'm going to await, I'm going to say as geos async. So I'm basically calling in the actual awaitable. Uh, piece, right? What's the problem here? Like we, we need to distinguish it. I'm going to take that route out from here. I'm going to put that route in here. I'm going to go uh, geos. This is the very first one API slash geos and this one will be v2. This is API v2 slash geos. That's how you should probably extend. There's probably fancier ways of doing the, the versioning on your controller. That's not the point. Don't fall into that rabbit hole. Stay with me here on the operational abstraction. Okay, let's run this thing. Is this thing working? Let's see. Uh, the beautiful thing about this project, and again, I'm going to share the link with you here, is that it, it comes in with the idea of seeding data. Like it comes in with data that you can see. You see all data.json. It has literally every single city, at least at the point of building this project uh, in the United States. Now let's go here and say um, uh, API. Let's, let's go to the Swagger doc. Here you go. So geos. Try it out, execute. This is going to run, warm up, and get the thing going. Let's go, let's go. There you go. So here's a response. That's every city. Let's do the same thing with the other one, the V2 geos. There we go. And here's the results, right? We have both results. So both are returning you know, three megs worth of data, right? And if you try this in Postman, it'll basically give you a um, about 500, 500 give or take kind of, uh, let, let's try it together. So here's, here's Postman. If you hit the geos, API v2 slash geos, API v2, here you go. That'll give you that in about 568 milliseconds. And then if you do the V1, performance-wise, that'll give you about, well, the first time it's hitting 1,105, but if you hit again, it's probably going to be like 600. This is the non-asynchronous, the non-asynchronous, the non-blocking, non the blocking one, the blocking one. But that's not how you test your performance, right? That's not how you test your performance. There is a better way for software engineers to test performance for the software. I talked in the past in, in a video, and I'm going to put the link in there as well, about how you can test the performance of something. You have a theory, and you want to test it. I'm not going to dig into building the benchmark piece right now. I'll just real quick, I'll say you install a library called uh, benchmark.net, and you basically build a class called benchmark. You initialize your client. We need to put the URL here in that client. I, can, I need to go here and say, I don't know, HTTP client http client dot base address and then I need to put the actual base address of the URLs that we're working with here so that's this guy boom just like that and this will hit API slash v2 and this will hit API slash geos and actually tells us the difference in performance right and I'll also talk a little bit about performance in a second but let me run this thing and let's see and just make sure it works the way it's supposed to uh, assembly benchmark defines benchmark is not optimized. Benchmark was built. Oh, I need to I need to put it in a release 
mode. Yeah, I remember that. that, that the last time I did this was like ages and ages ago, but it's always great when you're having a discussion and what is this? You are debugging a release build, just my code with da 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 results is degraded. Uh continue. There we go. So now this guy is gonna run these operations and give us some tests. Uh, while it's doing that, you know, whatever the performance is, this is just for the sake of argument, but if the difference between, and I want you to focus on this one, like if the difference between readable code and unreadable code, 300 milliseconds or, or 200, even if it's 300 milliseconds in difference in performance, always go to readable, always go to readable. Software or code was meant to be for humans to understand right machines don't understand anything right so if performance is an issue you know then that's an optimization thing that pro it's a problem in technology not a problem in the in the code itself that is readable if the code gets to a point that makes it readable enough even if it's not executing in one millisecond instead of two milliseconds then i would lean always towards the engineer side the maintenance the maintenance side because the cost of uh, unreadable code or hard to maintain code is exponentially higher, exponentially higher than the cost of uh, software that is uh, uh, readable that people can maintain, but it has a little bit of delay. There's always 50 million ways we can work with caching, we can work with queue, we can work with so many different tricks that we can have to make things faster. But being disciplined about writing proper code that people can understand, that's that's really where software engineering engineering sets right so it's running the operations uh, it, it it takes a it takes a second there in terms of like but I want to show you this in real time I really want to want you to see a migration process happen uh, you need to see how the uh, performance happens you know I kind of switch you, you I showed you what just in the middle kind of a you know the extension instead of modification for existing code We'll see what the results come up with. But now, like, you know, while we're, we're working, we're looking at this, now if you look at your API, now that interface is truly abstract because that interface is truly saying, maybe we can even go an extra mile and say I enumerable or something like that. Uh, I need to test with this. But this method in here specifically can support anything. You can, you can have an asynchronous operation, synchronous operation under the hood, and it doesn't impact you in any way, shape, or form. Just of course, letting on the side the fact that um, uh, the entity framework. This is a by, by the way, this is a super old app, you know, that I just pulled like 3.1. It was running on .NET 3.1. It's a very very old app, uh, but it still works because it's standard compliant. It's clean. It, you should just pull, build, and run, and it just uh, work. Uh, but I'm pretty sure the entity framework or whatever version of the entity framework could give you a capability to do asynchronously retrieval. So it doesn't block the operation. It's even better because you can scale and pull all the information and let it aggregate. But that's not the point of this. Even if it's not, even if that's not the case, it doesn't matter, right? The, what matters here is that you can have both value or task in your operation and it still works as expected. Let's take another look here. Um, it should give me some kind of a, a summary. I think it gave me the summary. So look at the difference here. So without value task, it's 640, right? With value task, 642, two milliseconds, two difference, two milliseconds. Doesn't matter at the le at the least, you know, if these two milliseconds that you're getting out of a big chunk of data, thousands of records, right, literally, gives you better readability and better abstraction than having engineers sit through like 500 different services and building it up right into like modifying all your flow just because you want to be asynchronous or you do what everyone uh, but what some people do is which is basically go and say oh just say dot result and move on right that's just like the cut corner kind of thing I, I wouldn't recommend doing that build code that makes you happy that that you know is right that is standardized that is test driven and all that kind of good stuff I hope uh, you find this a little bit useful. Moving onwards for the standard community, this is me announcing the 2.10.3 uh, of the standard, the, ver the version 2.10.3 of the standard. And for those who are not, you know, kind of familiar, I want I will also give you the link. But if you just kind of do a quick search in here and type in, let's see, uh, let's see here, the standard. To get the standard in here, this is the latest version 2.10.2. We will upgrade this version of the standard 
to kind of include it has a thousand likes people really love it it tells you about building software and whatnot it has a nice community behind it go check it out you know learn something from it and i hope you find this uh, uh, a little bit inspiring something for you to kind of think about you know in terms of uh, software development and i'll see you in another video thank you so much if you have any questions comments concerns drop a comment in the comment section and uh you know and don't forget to like and subscribe take care